Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to see you here. This is Trolls Road Church, and it is the third Sunday of Advent. And I'm here with my friend. Uh, actually, my friend doesn't have a name yet. Oh, my friend is getting excited. But uh, I'll talk about him in a minute. Uh, I, I want to just, uh, first of all, say uh, thank you to uh, Michael and Alyssa, our, our interns. Uh, they have been working with us since... August and are finishing up next week. And I am just so pleased with the way that they have uh, plugged themselves in and been so creative and faithful. Uh, perhaps yesterday you were part of our Zoom Christmas party that Alyssa and Michael organized. Uh, Michael and Alyssa were with Ron and I at the refuge uh, on Friday night. Whoa, hey, hey, easy, easy. Whoa, chicken whisperer. All right, here we go. Um, so we're very thankful for, for Michael and, and Alyssa, and uh, if you get a chance to appreciate them this week and just be praying for them, they are going to be continuing to serve uh, even though their internship is ending, and, and I'm just so thankful for their hearts and, and to have a, a, a young man, a young woman like that uh, leading in our church. So thanks to Michael and Alyssa. Uh, you might be asking, why am I holding a chicken? Is anyone curious? <laughs> Maybe you're not. Maybe you're just used to some stuff like this. But uh, this, uh, this little guy here is to help us celebrate our Advent offering. Uh, it's our E-I-E-I-O. I was trying to train him to sing E-I-E-I-O. Chickens are not very trainable. Um, next year, we're going we're gonna to call it the Chirp Chirp offering because I think I can train him to do that. Well, see, he's already excited about next year's offering. Um, the EIEIO offering, we were wanting to partner with Tier Fund Canada and ICCM to provide money for farmers around the world to help lift them out of poverty. And I am so encouraged and blown away to say that we've already raised over $4,000 towards our goal of $6,000. I would clap, but I have a chicken in my hands, so you can clap for him. There you go. Excellent. Just to let you know, that's approximately six virtual acres, one cow, 15 goats, over 50 Bibles, over 25 chickens, and a partridge in a pear tree. So we're very excited about that. Uh, you know, I am so impressed and so encouraged by your generosity as a church family all year long, but especially this Christmas, the way that you have given, uh, we, we, I believe, made over 230 Christmas dinners, and many of those dinners went to neighbors, went to people to encourage them, to send them love and let them know that Charles Road cares about them and God cares about them. We have, uh, I believe, Pastor Joan, was it over 100 gift cards? Uh, where is Pastor Joan? Oh, she's coming. Uh, I believe it was over 100 gift cards, as well as over 30 hampers just packed with food this week that will be going out and gifts. Uh, the generosity from you to our community is one of the best ways to tell people that God loves them. So thank you for your generosity, and we'll keep you updated on our Advent offering uh, up until Christmas Eve. So if you haven't given yet and you would like to do that, you can give, you can check our website for how to do that. Finally, just want to mention that uh, Christmas Eve is coming, and this year our plan, as we are able, is to have an in-person service at 7 o'clock. If you want to join us in the building, you have to pre-register, uh, and if you filled out the survey that said you would come to a service, that's not pre-registering. Uh, so you would need to either call the office this week or next week, or you need to do that online. And uh, if you could take care of that sooner than later, we do have a limited number of spots that we are allowed, so we want to make sure that everyone that wants to join us can. We will be streaming that service as well. But in addition, we are offering a pre-recorded service that will be available to you whenever you would like to use it. It will be online at the beginning of Christmas Eve day, and uh, that is an opportunity for you potentially to incorporate our Christmas Eve service into your Christmas Eve plans. So you can ask any questions you need to this week about that. Do you have a question? Very, very talkative chicken. Look at that. Chicken Whisperer, I'm telling you, I missed my calling. Um, and then uh, also we have a craft bag uh, and an opportunity with some goodies in it. So next Sunday or the week after, if you want to pop by the church and, and uh, take that home. And uh, it's, it's designed for kids, but if you're a big kid, you can come and grab one of those bags as well. It's a, a great way to be interactive with our service. Well, this is a, a, a special service for us at Charles Road. It's our poinsettia service. And as you can see, our, our stage is an ocean of red this morning. 
Uh, I want to thank the Kundermans for helping us uh, acquire these poinsettias, and uh, we're going to be talking a little bit later about it, but this is a special service as we reflect on the reality that Christmas is about joy, but at times during the Christmas season, it's difficult to have joy. And so we are going to turn our attention now to our Advent candle as we prepare our hearts for worship. Advent is a season of joy. It can be agonizing having to wait for something wonderful, but the closer we get to its arrival, joy begins to well up inside us. We see this watching a child right before they open a present, eyes wide with wonder, or experience it as our appetite is whetted with the delicious smells of Christmas dinner. There is joy in the moment of anticipation, but an even greater joy in the fulfillment of our anticipation. This joy is expressed by Simeon as Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to the temple to be dedicated. Sovereign Lord, my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. This kind of joy is not the result of all the difficult circumstances in our life being removed. It is allowing the magnitude of what is being celebrated overwhelm our difficult circumstances. In Luke 2, the angel declared to the shepherds, I bring you good news of great joy for all people. Today, a savior has been born to you. Have you responded with joy to the arrival of Jesus that first Christmas? Have you responded with joy to the arrival of Jesus in your life as your Lord and savior? We light the third Advent candle to acknowledge the joy that Jesus brings to all that receive him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to be our Savior. Would you help us celebrate his arrival into our world and into our lives this Christmas so we might experience the joy that only he can bring? Might our joy spill out as a light for people around us experiencing darkness. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Thank you to Doreen Croak for that beautiful reading. Uh, we're going to sing a few Christmas songs, but let's not miss the story and the words that these hold. I invite you to stand if you'd like, if you're in the building, and if you're at home, you can sing with joy as we worship together.
Just invite you to be seated. Thank you, worship team, for leading us. This is a, a Sunday tradition during Advent for us at Charles Road Church, and I know there are other churches that have something similar. Uh, we simply refer to it as our Poinsettia Sunday. And these poinsettias have a, a tremendous meaning for us, aside from the, the beauty and just how great it makes the platform look. It's the case that at Christmas time, not everybody enjoys the season the way that we sing about or the way that we talk about it. As a matter of fact, it's kind of a double pressure because if you're not excited about Christmas for whatever reason, there's the added burden and pressure to not let on that you're struggling so that you can join in in the festivities and you don't take away from anyone else's joy. And I know that in some of the Christmases in, in my past that have been very difficult, I have felt the guilt that comes with not feeling the joy that we sing about, especially as Christians. And so this morning, this Poinsettia Sunday accomplishes a few different things. First of all, these poinsettias represent people, they represent loved ones that we have lost. Maybe this past year or maybe in a previous year. And so many of these poinsettias have a card with a name on it. Somewhere in here, uh, my mom's name is on a card and one of these poinsettias is for her. Uh, it's a way for me to include my mom in this Christmas celebration and to include those wonderful memories. And for, for many of you, I'm sure it's the same thing. The truth is that there's always a little piece of us missing, isn't there, at Christmas when a loved one is no longer with us. And so we, we celebrate their lives and, and we celebrate their memories and these poinsettias help us do that. But it's not just those loved ones that these poinsettias represent. They also represent permission this morning. They represent the permission to struggle at Christmas time. To let you know that there is no guilt if you are having a difficult Christmas and you don't feel like singing joy to the world. That, that certainly if you are struggling, that God loves you and is not upset that you are struggling. As a matter of fact, he wants to meet you in your struggle. And so these poinsettias also represent permission and acknowledging that Christmas can be a difficult season. But perhaps most importantly this morning, these poinsettias represent hope. They represent hope because we have come with our loss, we have come with our struggle, and we have come to Jesus. And that's the invitation of Christmas, that we can come to Jesus because he has already come to us. In, in John chapter 16, Jesus told his followers at a very difficult time in their lives, in this world you will have much trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. And so this morning, as we continue on with our service, perhaps in your sorrow and grief, maybe even in your despair this morning, Jesus is inviting you to come to him. And we want to focus our attention and fix our eyes on him. And we're going to do that right now, and I'm going to invite Pastor Joan to come, and she's going to lead us in prayer and point us to Jesus. I would like to invite you to pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we want to begin our prayer time this morning by just saying thank you for providing this wonderful place where we can meet with you in this place without any disturbance today. We thank you for the people who are with us in person, and we also thank you for the people who are listening from home and participating in this prayer time. Just now, Father, we want to slow our pace from a busy week and give ourselves to you completely, just in worship and praise this morning. We're here to honor you and to give you glory as best we can in our human weakness. We offer praise to you, our all-powerful and ever-present God. May everything within us this morning cry out, Holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. We have so much to thank you for, Heavenly Father. We thank you for food and shelter, friends and family, and so much more. But most of all, we thank you that when humanity missed the mark, you didn't leave us in our sin, 
but you came to us in Jesus Christ. And we're especially thankful for that as we think to celebrate Christmas this season. Our words can't express the gratitude for this indescribable gift that you've given to us in Jesus. They called his name Jesus, for he would save his people from their sins. He's our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting Father, our Prince of Peace. And now, Lord, we bring our imperfect selves to you. We recognize that harboring sin in our hearts is a hindrance to our prayers. So we just want to pause right now to confess the wrongs that we're aware of. We repent and we ask you to cleanse our hearts. Father, thank you for forgiving us for the things that we did that we shouldn't have and for the things that we didn't do that we should have. We're undeserving of your goodness, yet you keep on loving and forgiving us. We pray, Father, that you would renew our minds and change our hearts. Lord, you invite us to bring our burdens and our cares to you. First of all, we want to just say thank you for the physical care that you've given to members of our congregation who've had come through successful surgeries and are now involved in recovery. We pray that you would be with them in special ways. And we also bring those of our family who are sick and in chronic pain. Lord, would you be the healer in every circumstance? And Father, on this poinsettia Sunday, we're comforted to know that you, are, you know our hearts and you share our sorrows. We give you thanks for the lives that are represented in these poinsettias. We're grateful for the legacy of faith that they have left. And we pray that you would help us to be faithful in carrying on that legacy. We remember those who are grieving more recently uh, their losses. Would you be close to their broken hearts and rescue their crushed spirits? We pray that you would minister comfort and be light in their darkness. And this morning, Father, we think of the Corner Church and of the ways that they are able to meet the practical needs of their community. We pray also that you would give them opportunities to be able to introduce people to Jesus as their Savior. We want to pray this morning for Bethesda House. We thank you for a place that provides shelter and support to women and children suffering from domestic abuse. We pray, Father, for the resources that are needed there to enable these women to reestablish their lives once again. Our thoughts turn to countries that are ravaged by war and poverty and disease and the pan pandemic. Would you minister to broken, hurting, hungry hearts and relieve their suffering? Thank you for the progress that's being made with the COVID vaccine, and we pray that it would be effective in controlling and ending this virus. Father, you've given Pastor John a word for us today. We pray that you would fill him with your spirit as he shares it with us. Would you use it to equip us, challenge us, inspire us, and teach us? And Father, help us to listen and learn and live the truth that we hear this morning. We thank you for being with us for the remainder of the service, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
Christmas time, we talk a lot about lights, but we don't always talk about darkness. And so this morning, we want to talk about the light in the darkness by, by acknowledging darkness. This, uh, this season is, as I mentioned earlier, not an easy season for people. And this year, we're all experiencing that to some degree with the pandemic, but, but on a much deeper level, there are people that are going through just incredible challenge. And then when you consider overseas or you consider other countries and other realities that, that seem so foreign to us, almost like they, can, they couldn't exist in this time and this place, that those people are experiencing Christmas in that reality. And so to talk about light, we first need to talk about darkness. Now, our ordinary Christmas tree is looking a little less ordinary this week, uh, last week, Pastor Tyler talked about decorations, and he, he has decorated for us this week, but there, there's still some, some pieces missing from this ordinary tree. Now, the thing that will make this tree extraordinary is what we celebrate through this tree, not what we do to it. But to make it look a little bit more like Christmas, it needed some decorations, and, and this morning we're going to talk about lights, uh, because a complete Christmas tree needs lights. I was watching Dr. Seuss's The Grinch Who Stole Christmas, and I was, as I, as I watch, you know, anytime you see greatness in, in art, you always think of the rest of the catalog. You read some Shakespeare, you think other Shakespearean plays, you know, so I'm watching Dr. Seuss, The Grinch, and I think of his catalog of extraordinary uh, literature. Oh, the places you'll go pop to mind. You'll be on the way up. You'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers who soar to high heights. Wherever you fly, you'll be best of the best. Wherever you go, you will top all the rest. Except when you don't, because sometimes you won't. I'm sorry to say, but sadly it's true that bang-ups and hang-ups can happen to you. You can get all hung up in a prickly perch, and your gang will fly on. You'll be left in a lurch. You'll come down from the lurch with an unpleasant bump. And the chances are then that you'll be in a slump. And when you're in a slump, you're not in for much fun. Unslumping yourself is not easily done. Well, that's a, a cute little children's book that has some profound truth in it. But as I was thinking of that passage, what struck me is some of our Christmas songs. It's the most wonderful time of the year except when it's not. And what if this Christmas it's not a wonderful time of the year for you or someone that you love? What if the smiles and laughter that we see on commercials that have to be true, right? What if those smiles and laughter are something that you can't participate in? What if the, the, the joy and the peace that we sing about in our Christmas carols and read about in our Christmas cards is not your reality this morning? What if the, the Christmas miracle in every movie being played on TV during this month is sheer fiction for you? Christmas is not a happy time for everyone. And something that I am discovering more and more each Christmas is that Christmas does not create problems it magnifies challenges, doesn't it? If you have a, a broken heart, Christmas magnifies that. If you have financial stress in your life, Christmas magnifies that. If, if you have soul searching going on, Christmas magnifies that. And so this morning, many of us have hurts that are being magnified as we talk about the Christmas story. I was reading in Psychology Today this week about Christmas and the struggle for people at Christmas. And I learned some interesting things. It, it's it talked about the misnomer that actually suicide rates go down at Christmas. They don't go up, which I, I was always under the assumption that the opposite was true. But it quickly went on to say, however, most people experience worse mental health around Christmas than any other time of the year. And 24% of people report being significantly challenged in their mental health at Christmas time. Now, there's some obvious reasons for that. Things that challenge our mental health and challenge our, our soul and its, its, its joy are things like stress and anxiety. Well, what affects stress and anxiety? Well, finances. Does Christmas have an impact on finances? 
Yeah. Relationships can be stressful and, and fill us with anxiety. Are there lots of relationships at Christmas time? Yeah. As a matter of fact, there was a whole section in the article that talked about having to spend time with family you don't know very well, but have to pretend that you know or at least like. And so these things add stress. These things, and then we respond to it. And we don't always respond to these things well. How do we cope with stress around Christmas time? Well, apparently there's a lot of eating going on. Overeating is a bad way to cope with stress. I think we all agree, even though I suspect most of us are guilty at times. Consumption, overconsumption of anything actually is ways that we cope. And so if you drink too much, if you eat too much, if you spend too much money, you purchase too much, thinking these things will help you cope, they actually add to your stress and anxiety. More than half the people surveyed in this uh, experiment done by Psychology Today expected this Christmas to be less happy than previous Christmases. And when I read the biblical narrative... I sometimes read it through that snow globe lens of a soft, peaceful evening. But I want you to think about the darkness that exists throughout the Christmas story, both literally and figuratively. Think about the manger scene itself and the darkness and the baby born in that manger. Think about the shepherds out in the darkness on that cold night before the angels arrive. Or the magi that are following the star at night. And the many dreams involved in the Christmas story. Evening, nighttime, and darkness. But on top of that, the uncertainty, the fear, and the danger, quite literally in some cases, follows. And so this morning, we want to acknowledge that darkness, not just that first Christmas, but that darkness this Christmas. Because at the center of that first Christmas, there is a light. A light that that is providing warmth, a glow of hope. And that's what we want to experience this morning. In Isaiah chapter 8, we read, Then they will look towards the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. And this verse is in a a passage, in a context that that we look to sometimes for uh, a prophecy about the birth of Christ. But again, the light prophecy comes on the heels of talking about darkness, disorientation, confusion. Now, Isaiah is writing to the people of uh, of Judah, and the Assyrian army, which was a very nasty and powerful army of that day, was on the brink of invading them. We also know there was political unrest as their king has just died And then there's spiritual rebellion and confusion, and you see that throughout the book of Isaiah. Well, if you fast forward to the Christmas account in the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew, you see something similar. There's Roman occupation, there's corrupt leadership, and there is spiritual confusion. And personally, for the people involved in the Christmas account, you have a pregnant virgin, a confused spouse, scared shepherds, and, and that's just a few of the characters. Think about the Magi. Think about uh, King Herod. Think about the, the, the Pharisees and religious leaders. There's a lot going on, and it all brings us back to this darkness and disorientation. And we lose our bearings in the dark. And not even Christmas can help us get our bearings if we don't have any light. What do you do when you're faced with this kind of darkness? What should we do? Well, Isaiah goes on and tells us that the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. This is God's response to darkness, always. It's light. Think with me to Genesis chapter 1. And this theme is a thread you can pull on through all of Scripture. This thread of darkness and light. But in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it says that the earth was formless and empty and there was darkness over the surface of the deep. There was confusion. There was danger. There was this this blackness. And into all of that, God speaks a single sentence. Do you remember what the sentence is? It's right here in Genesis chapter 1. What does it say? God said, 
Let there be light. That is God's response to darkness in Genesis, but throughout the pages of Scripture in Isaiah, we see that the people walking in darkness, a light has dawned. What, what light is dawning? God is speaking into their darkness and saying, let there be light. God is responsible for the light. We can't take credit for that, but we can point to it. We can enjoy it. I like to take my girls up to Old Scugog Road to see the Christmas lights. I don't think it would be very honest of me to say, I did this, girls, just for you. I spent a couple of weeks putting up some lights so that you could enjoy some cocoa and this. No, I had nothing to do with it. I just showed up. And thank you for those of you that live on Old Scugog Road that uh, give us that wonderful traffic jam to, uh, to enjoy. But we can't take credit for lights. We can enjoy the, the work of someone else and, and God provides light. We can't manufacture that kind of light, that kind of hope. But when we are in darkness, we can look for light. As a matter of fact, God invites us to cry out for light. I was reading in the uh, Daily Bread uh, earlier this week and it, it referenced a famous prayer. Maybe you'll recognize it. Dear Father in heaven, I'm not a praying man, but if you're up there and you can hear me, show me the way. I'm at the end of my rope. You want to recognize? It's words of George Bailey from It's a Wonderful Life. Now, I'm not going to go with most of the theology in that movie, but that prayer is a good prayer. We cry out to God for light when we're in the darkness. But so often I am tempted to manufacture light, to create light on my own. And we can create flickers of light, certainly. We can create flickers of happiness, but the hope that you need this Christmas, the hope that we all need this Christmas, can only be found in the light that God provides. And so that is where we need to go. Psalm 119 verse 50 says, My comfort in my suffering is this, your promise preserves my life. If you're in darkness this morning, there is a promise God has made to you. He will not leave or forsake you. That even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you fear no evil because God is with you. The presence of God and his accompanying light is for you this Christmas. Many of us have been uh, using our Bible app. Um, if you have a U version of the, the Bible app on your phone, there's some great uh, uh, devotionals and, and different readings and, and uh, videos that you can check out. I would encourage that. Actually, Tear Fund uh, worldwide has put together a beautiful Advent devotional. And uh, a few days ago, there was one that really struck me, and I think it speaks to us this morning. It's about Martha, who lives in Nigeria, and one of the Tear Fund photographers uh, who, who takes pictures and tells stories of what Tear Fund is up to, and more importantly, what God is up to around the world, tells this story. Three months prior to our meeting, Martha's village was one of 15 which had come under attack. Many people died, and many more people were displaced. When I met Martha, she and her six-month-old son, Benjamin, were living alongside 3,000 others in a makeshift camp, a former government building where they would sleep shoulder to shoulder with others on the floor each night. Somehow, amidst these bleak circumstances, Martha carried an incredible sense of deep-rooted joy. She explained that the fountain of this joy was found within the hope she has in Jesus. Whenever she was feeling overwhelmed, she knew she could find peace through praying or singing and worship. I, I, I can't fathom that response to that reality. I mean, my life has challenges in it, and certainly we're all facing a difficult Christmas because of the pandemic, and our situations are all different, but we all have things that have caused hurt in our lives. But I, I can't relate to that story, and yet she has joy, and she is very specific about the source of that joy and light in her darkness, and it's Jesus. And I'm inspired by that. I'm humbled by that. And sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed because I struggle to have that kind of hope in far brighter circumstances than she is experienced. But this morning, the goal is not to, to make us feel bad or to give us any sense of shame. It's to give us the opportunity to respond to the light that God is offering. 
And in Isaiah chapter 9, we get to a very familiar verse. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This prophecy in Isaiah, hundreds of years earlier, points to what happens in Luke chapter 2. And this is God's word to you this morning. Let there be light. Charles Wesley penned these words in one of my favorite hymns, And Can It Be? Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. You know, Jesus knows a lot about darkness, doesn't he? I mean, think about the life of Jesus. Not only was he born under the cover of darkness, but the Bible says that while he was praying at night, that some religious cowards came under the same cloak of darkness to arrest him. It says that he was tried at night and falsely accused. And when he was hung on the cross in the middle of the day, it became dark as night. As he died on a cross... So that you and I could experience the light. And can you imagine the blackness in that tomb as the, ro- as the stone is rolled and sealed shut? Jesus knows a lot about darkness. But praise God, he knows even more about light. Because on the third day, at dawn, as light is emerging on the horizon, light bursts forth from the tomb. Jesus is alive. And Jesus would go and ascend to heaven where he lives in the the brilliance and the brightness of the heavenly glory. And it says that Jesus will come back again one day, only this time not under the cover of darkness, but in all his glory on the clouds, and the whole world will see him. And in eternity, in the the book of Revelation, it says there's no need for a sun or a moon because the glory of God and, and the glory of the Lamb, that is Jesus, will be its light. That is the promise that God has for you this morning in your darkness. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Anyone who walks with me will no longer walk in darkness. So if you are in darkness today, if you feel like there is a a blanket of cloud that covers you, that follows you, that haunts you, I would first of all encourage you to reach out. Don't don't do this alone and get the appropriate help. Those things are good tools and they will help you cope and they will help you survive and they will improve your situation. But nothing will give you the hope this morning that the light of the world can offer you. And that's why Jesus came. The angel said to the shepherds, I bring you good news of great joy for all people. A Savior is born. The light of the world has come to you in your darkness. So I'd like to encourage you to consider a couple of things this morning. First of all, this is for people that are, that are feeling the darkness, that are feeling the struggle, the challenge of Christmas, but it's for all of us. The first thing that we need to do is we need to look to Jesus. There's a lot of things that will fight for our attention. There's a lot of things that are good things, that are nice things. But certainly, it's our opportunity by invitation to look to Jesus and focus on him. How can we do that? Well, one of the best ways is to open our Bibles. Is if we we take our Bibles and do some devotions, some Advent readings. We open the scriptures and we read about this Jesus. And we will discover all of this beautiful light that he wants to shine into our lives. But it's not just looking to Jesus. The invitation, as Jesus declares himself to be the light of the world, is to follow him, to walk with him. How do we follow Jesus? Well, if we're reading the scriptures, those ideas will just bubble to the surface and jump off the page. But certainly, as Pastor Joan prayed this morning, one of the ways to follow Jesus is to get rid of sin, confess our sin, get rid of the things that are preventing us from connecting and being close to Jesus. Spend time with Jesus in prayer. Spend time with people that love Jesus and talk about him and celebrate him. 
Spend time with people who don't know Jesus and tell them about him. These are all ways for us to follow him. Look at the Bible and see, to, see the places where Jesus went and go to those places in Jesus' name. That's the way to follow Jesus. But also this morning, I would encourage you to worship Jesus. Much like that testimony from Martha in a very dark and desperate place, talking about the power of worship as a way to receive the light of Christ in her life. You can worship, not just by singing Christmas carols, although that is a great start because our Christmas carols have some of the best lyrics of the Christian reality. But also consider other ways of worshiping and declaring the praise of God and the great things that Jesus has done in your life. This morning, if you are in darkness, I would encourage you to consider the fact you don't need to feel bad about it. You don't need to feel guilty or feel stressed like there's something you need to do. You need to understand that Jesus came to you to bring the light to you and is inviting you this morning to look to him. As the worship team comes, I want you to be thinking about two things as we sing a, a few songs to close our service. One, if you are in that place of struggle, then know that you are loved by God. And you're loved by this church, and we're here for you. But if you're here this morning, and maybe your Christmas is going all right, maybe it's going really well, well, there's probably someone in your life that comes to mind as I'm talking about these things. God is giving you that person, is giving you that person to love and protect this Christmas, for you to be a conduit of God's light. And I'm not sure exactly what that will look like, because it'll be different in every situation. But certainly, you have the opportunity to make the invitation on Jesus' behalf and to speak the words of God into their darkness. Let there be light. So let's look to Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for
Amen, and thank you, worship team, for leading us this morning. Um, I was just uh, thinking if you're online and you're watching, or if you're here in the, in the room, if one of these poinsettias is for a loved one uh, in your life, why, if you want to tell us about that person or just mention their name, that would be a great way to honor their memory. And, uh, and if you did um, uh, make a donation for one of these poinsettias, you're welcome to take it home after the service or sometime this week, come and pick it up. And uh, certainly some will be left here to, to add to our platform and that reminder of the joy and the hope that we can have even in a challenging and difficult circumstance. Well, our tree is looking a little less ordinary with decorations, and I think now we can add some lights to it. And it's starting to look a little bit better. But may this tree, or any tree, distract us from... Christmas. And so if this tree accomplishes its job, it won't be a pretty tree or an extraordinary tree. It will point us to the light of the world, our extraordinary Jesus. Thank you for spending some time with us this morning. God bless you. Have a great week and go in peace.